Hi, I'm John Pieberg, and I'm going to talk to you today about a paper that was recently accepted in Methods in Ecology and Evolution with Mark Dittmer. There's lots of interesting research questions that involve trying to identify causal relationships among physiological, behavioral, and animal movement processes. We're seeing more applications in the literature in part because of technological advances that have resulted in some really interesting data sets like the one I'll talk about today. In addition, there have been advances in analytical machinery that allow us to better model latent states. Today I'll be talking about some of the challenges involved with trying to infer causal relationships among some of these processes. In particular, I'll be talking about an example in which we try and model the relationship between movement and heart rates uh, from data collected on black bears. The heart devices shown here were developed by Medtronic. They measure roughly six centimeters by two centimeters by one centimeter and were implanted underneath the bare skin. Data were then downloaded later on and during winter den checks. So Mark came to me with these data. He had movement rates that he had estimated from GPS location data and he had these heart rate data which were essentially daily averages and he wanted to relate the two time series. His underlying goal was to try and understand the cost of movement in a highly fragmented and agricultural landscape where these bears live. Here we see the two time series plotted side by side, both on a log scale. We have the daily heart rates here, daily movement rates here. There's a fair bit of noise in the movement rates, but they both follow the same sort of seasonal pattern. And we also see this sort of spike in early November in both cases. So if we plotted the two time series next to each other or, or against each other, we would expect to see a positive correlation. And indeed, that's what you see. You see a strong positive correlation between the two time series. And if you fit a least squares regression line to the data, you get a positive slope that's highly yeah. significant. However, the errors are autocorrelated out to many lags. So the next thing Mark did was try and fit a model that assumed that the errors followed an AR1 structure. And when he did this, the slope was estimated to be very close to zero, huh? which was puzzling given the, given the strong positive correlation between the two time series. In addition, the autocorrelation parameter was estimated to be very close to 1. So we set out to try and figure out why this happens. We attacked the problem in two different ways. We began by just trying to understand why the models behaved as they did by plotting the data and, and also inspecting the structure of the AR1 model. Secondarily, we tried to come up with some directed acyclical graphs that might explain the observed data patterns. One of the things we noticed early on was that today's movement was correlated with yesterday's heart rate, even if we conditioned on yesterday's movement rate. Uh, when this occurs, the covariate process is said to be endogenous with respect to the response, and there's implications for model fitting and estimation when this occurs. For example, unbiased estimation of cross-sectional mean parameters that relate x sub t and y sub t requires a working independence assumption. We can gain further insight into the behavior of the AR1 model by writing it as an autoregressive distributed lag model. Specifically, with a little algebra, we can show that the model structure is given by this expression here, where um, it's an autoregressive model because the previous response enters in with a coefficient that's equivalent to the autocorrelation parameter, and the previous predictor enters in as well, and its coefficient is constrained to be the negative of rho times beta 1, where beta 1 is the slope parameter for x sub t. If we look at scatter plots of the data, we see that today's heart rate is correlated with yesterday's movement rate, today's movement rate, and yesterday's heart rate. Um, all three associations are positive, which is uh, incompatible with the AR1 model. So essentially, it estimates a high autocorrelation parameter, which captures this relationship and it fits essentially a flat line here um, to avoid the uh, implication of a negative association between today's heart rate and yesterday's movement rate. Okay, so now we've come up with an explanation for why the models behave as they do. The next step was to try and understand what sorts of processes could give rise to the observed correlation patterns in the data. And for that we turn to directed acyclical graphs. One potential explanation for observed endogeneity is a causal feedback loop, whereby yesterday's response influences the subsequent predictor variable. This uh, explanation seemed unlikely in our particular application. We didn't expect that a high heart rate on one day would influence the movement patterns on the next day. However, there are plenty of applications where this sort of model makes sense. In the medical literature, treatments are often prescribed depending on current or previous disease status. 
In the economics literature, demand for consumer goods often depends on recent price. And in the behavioral literature, um, there are models, for example, of feeding activity that depend on physiological state variables uh, that represent whether an individual is satiated or not. Another more plausible explanation is that there might be an unmeasured confounder related to both movement and the heart rate. So for example, consider this simple model here in which movement's correlated through time, but there's no feedback loop between yesterday's heart rate and today's movement. In this simple model here, x sub t will be independent of y sub t minus one once we condition on the previous movement. Similarly, y sub t will be independent of y sub t minus one if we condition on either today's movement or yesterday's movement. Neither of these statements will be true if there's an unmeasured confounder that's related to both the movement and the heart rate process. For example, perhaps there's some stressor that both elevates an individual's heart rate and makes it move more to escape, say, some sort of risk. In this case, x sub t will no longer be uh, independent of y sub t minus one if we condition on x sub t minus one. There'll still be a path through the unmeasured confounder. So this is a potential explanation, perhaps, for the observed data patterns. And we'd expect this sort of problem to be relevant to a lot of uh, questions that are addressed with biotelemetry data. We also use directed acyclical graphs to explore the impact of measurement error. So again, consider this simple model where movement rates are correlated through time, but there's no feedback between yesterday's heart rate and today's movement pattern. Now consider that instead of observing movement directly, we estimate movement rates. Um, and these are the predictors that are actually appearing in our model. They're movement rates that are estimated with error. In this case, y sub t and y sub t minus one will not be independent uh, of each other if we condition on the estimates of movement rates. There's still a path that flows through the true movement rates that connects these two variables. Similarly, um, our estimates of movement rates will be endogenous with the uh, response process. Even if we condition on the movement rate from the previous day, there's still a path that flows between the estimated movement on day t and the heart rate on day t minus one. We also simulated data according to this model, and you can show that if there's quite a bit of measurement error here that you can actually duplicate the sort of behavior that we noted with our uh, real data. That if you fit an ordinary least squares regression model, you get a positive slope, but if you fit an AR1 model, the slope parameter essentially goes to zero. Ultimately, we argue that the best approach to analyzing the data really depends on the underlying goal. AIC and similar model selection tools are often used uh, for choosing an appropriate model, and this may be reasonable for prediction. However, for explanation, in this case, we really need to consider the potential for other confounding variables, and we also need to deal with the measurement error issue. More generally, directed acyclical graphs are the key to understanding observational data. We use them to explore potential mechanisms responsible for the observed data patterns in our black bear example. They're also useful for guiding selection of predictor variables and regression analyses, and more importantly, they provide a framework for estimating direct and indirect causal effects from observational data.